Unlike other technologies, AR and VR has the potential to enable people to experience what someone else is seeing, hearing, and feeling. Our next speaker is professor of the University of South Australia, Mark Billinghurst, who will explore the coming age of empathic computing and how AR and VR technology can be combined with wearable physiological sensors to create shared empathic experiences. Please join me in welcoming Mark Billinghurst to the stage. Clicker on the stage? Uh, yeah, great. It's a clicker there. Great. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for coming. My name is Tom. Introduce me as Mark Billinghurst from the University of South Australia. And I don't know about all of you, but sometimes I feel I wish I could have some sort of magic ball that would let me look into the uh, future and see where all this technology is, is going. Over the last couple of days in the exhibition hall next door, we've seen some fantastic examples of a wide variety of wearable um, and AR and VR technologies. And of course, these have been applied in many application areas like gaming and health, education, and so forth. But what I'd like to talk about today is one direction I think has a promising future. And um, that direction is in the area of um, empathy. So empathy is famously defined by Alfred Adler as being, being able to see with the eyes of another person, listen with the ears of another person, feel with the heart of another person. And in many ways, empathy is what makes us create strong connections with each other as, as humans. And over the last uh, decade or so, there's been a lot of research in this space, and in particular in the area which now is becoming called empathic computing in three different topics. So one is um, building systems that can understand our feelings and emotions. Uh, secondly, is building systems that help us better experience the world of others and, and, and the experiences they live in. And thirdly, building systems that help us um, share the experiences of others. So in order to do this, we need to, first of all, to understand emotions, have some sort of sensory systems. Uh, for experiencing um, other people's experiences, um, virtual reality is an ideal technology for that. And for sharing and, and connect with other people live, uh, augmented reality is a good technology for that. And over the next few minutes, I'll give you some examples of each of these. So first of all, the area of understanding. This was uh, famously popularized by Professor Roz Picard at the MIT Media Lab. And about 20 years ago, she started doing work on um, uh, effective uh, computing and basically building systems that can recognize uh, your emotions and respond to them. So one of them is um, a company called Affectiva. And at Fictiva, have um, built technology that recognizes your emotions from face expressions. So you can see here an example of using the, the BB-8 ball, and the ball re re responds to his emotions. So when he's angry, the ball runs away from him, and when he's happy, the ball comes back uh, towards him. So kind of a simple little demo. But it's characteristic of technology that um, responds to a single person's um, uh, emotions. So secondly, in terms of experiencing, um, Noni did a Pina is a very famous uh, new media artist and journalist, and she says that virtual reality offers a whole different medium to tell stories that really connect with people and create an empathic uh, connection. And so she's been, over the last four or five years, been developing immersive journalistic experiences that help you um, experience um, situations where you not, may not necessarily be in. And one of them, uh, she's developed a couple of very famous ones. One of them was called uh, Project Syria, and she took uh, video footage of a terrorist bomb going off in a marketplace in Syria, and then she recreated that as an immersive virtual reality experience. So you can walk through this market, it looks very beautiful, lots of people there, and then after a minute or so, you hear the bomb going off, you see smoke, and you see body parts, and it's a very traumatic um, experience. And that helped people who aren't in Syria understand what it was like to be living in that environment. I won't show you that, because that's a bit of a traumatic experience, but I'll show you a second video clip from a project she did called Project Homeless, where she tried to give people the experience of what it was like being homeless in, in, in Los Angeles. So um, this is the Project Homeless video. And this is a, a, a VR experience based around actual audio clip of an experience of people uh, homeless. So in this case, these people are waiting in a, a line outside a food bank. And um, you'll see in a second uh, the 3D environment. And they're waiting together. And they're all lined up. And something happens um, while they're waiting. So you can start hearing a Please bit of a discussion watch. going on. Okay, and if you watch this man in the white shirt, um, he collapses and he actually starts having an epileptic fit. And so, and then people start responding to that. So um, in the VR environment, you're able to experience what it's like being in that, in that situation. 
Another example I, re I really liked was a project called Childhood that was shown at SIGGRAPH last year. And this is a very interesting project by Kenji Suzuki from the University of Tsukuba. And he wanted to create the experience of what it was like to be a child. And of course, we've all been ch children, but most of us can't remember anymore what it was like to be four or five years old. So he used a VR system to create that experience where you could um, basically uh, wear an a Oculus Rift head mount display with some cameras but you took the cameras from your, from your eye point and you put them down at your belt and you moved the eye cameras closer together to simulate the eye separation of a young child. And also, there was a special um, hand, a little mini plastic hand you put inside your real hand that simulated the grip of a young uh, child as well. It's a childhood project so you can see that video here. The, uh, transform your embodiment into a child by using wearable devices. Here we have the hand exoskeleton to simulate child's tiny hand and we also have a viewpoint translator to simulate child's perspe uh, perspective. So this is the uh, hand exoskeleton. It's uh, uh, based on the five years old children's dimensions. So designers can feel the usability of products and toys for the children through their own hand. This is the adult normal seizure and normal uh, IPD, the papillary distance. And the uh, children has a little smaller, uh, uh, closer uh, papillary distance, so I make it a little closer. And uh, I make my uh, stature lower by removing my eyes like this. And put it oh, here. This so the about, motion of the camera uh, is a slave to your head. Stature. Uh, the, the children who is... Uh so I tried that experience with SIGGRAPH and it was quite remarkable. You really did feel like you're being transformed back to be a five-year-old and you couldn't grab big objects anymore. You're looking at everybody in belt level. You couldn't see up the table. So it was quite an amazing experience. So, so far I've talked about how using um, sensors you can capture and res respond to um, individual people's emotions. I've talked about how using virtual reality you can f have the experience of another person's experience. Um, and those both areas have been very well researched right now and, and becoming very popular. The third area that we're doing our work in is this an area of sharing it cu current experiences. And what we want to look at is can we develop systems that allow us to share what we are seeing, feeling, and hearing with other people. And it turns out this is an area that hasn't been very well researched right now, so it's a great area to do our work in. And so last year, or this year, we developed a, a set of glasses called the empathy glasses. And the idea is well, when you're wearing these glasses, you can um, transmit what you're seeing to a remote person and also information about your face expression and your feelings as well. And so we combined three pieces of technology together. First of all, um, an eye tracker. Secondly, the um, Epson um, AR display. And uh, thirdly, a special pair of glasses called the Effective Wear glasses. And so one person wears this um, using the Epson uh, display and, and camera. We can send a video view to a remote person. And we can use the eye tracker to know exactly where they're looking. And the effective wear glasses um, tell you about your face expression. So this allows us to send implicit cues about what we're doing uh, to a remote person. So the effective wear glasses are special glasses that we developed with our, Chinese, our Japanese partners where we took photo sensors and mapped them around the frame of a pair of glasses. And when you uh, perform different face expressions, your muscles move the skin closer to the camera or to the photo sensors. By measuring the distance, we can know what face expression you're performing. So this allowed us to move away from having a fixed camera facing your face. So by, um, you, this system allows us to recognize eight face expressions um, quite reliably. So in practice, we would have one person wearing this pair of glasses and performing a collaborative action, like trying to, to uh, do a physical task in the real world. And then he would send video of that task to a remote person. The remote person can uh, use a pointer and to annotate the video and send the pointer back so he can say, oh, um, you know, move this block or this object. But we're also tracking the eye gaze position, and that helps us um, give us information about whether or not the person's actually following those instructions. And so I'll show you the video of this working. So here, see, here's the empathy glasses right here. Um, here's the remote um, collaborator. And the, they're trying to collaborate together on build, putting together a, a picture made out of blocks. So they're trying to work together about how they're going to put the blocks together. The remote person can talk to him and move this um, green dot pointer, saying move this block here. Uh, the, the red dot is the, his eye gaze. So this is really important because the, the remote person can say move the block over here. And if the person's eye gaze isn't following where he's pointing, he knows the person isn't paying attention. And also at the bottom here, we have a heart rate sensor and a face expression sensor um, as well. So as he starts uh, changing face expressions, uh, we can know what expression he's uh, performing. 
So the overall um, message from this is that we can use the technology to provide um, implicit uh, cues. So normally with a system like this, without the uh, eye gaze tracker, you would have to watch the person reaching out and grabbing objects with the real hands or talking about things. But now because we're monitoring the eye gaze, people will always look at objects before they interact with them, and the remote user now has a much richer uh, remote collaboration with them and gets a better sense of what the person is feeling and what they're doing. So in a variety of user studies, the lessons we learned from this, first of all, pointing from both sides really helps in remote collaboration. The gaze is really exciting because it shows the context of what the person is talking about, and it helps uh, establish shared understanding and awareness and also focus of attention. Uh, the face expression actually didn't work out as well as we thought because we forgot that when people are speaking, they also exhibit lots of face expressions. And so our face expression monitor was saying the person's angry, surprised, but that actually they weren't. So, but it was useful in certain cases where a person would give um, some options and the person listening might be feeling confused and that would show in the face expression monitor. Um, but of course, it's easy to fix if we just have a microphone, monitor the microphone, and whenever the microphone's catching their speaking, we can ignore those face expressions, then it'll be fine. So there's some limitations with this uh, technique so far. We have some limited ex implicit cues. Um, the task we chose wasn't a particularly scary task or didn't really elicit a lot of emotion. And um, as I said before, the glasses need some improvement. And the most recent work we're doing is looking at how we can take that lesson and apply it into a uh, VR environment. So we're developing a VR environment now that involves a one person um, in playing a, 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 or being experiencing a VR environment, and a second person also wearing a head mount display, but seeing exactly what they're seeing. But then, so their view is slave to the, the player. And we have a variety of scary and exciting environments you can put them in. But not only do we sh share the view, but we also share some emotional signals coming from a heart rate monitor and a, um, a, a GSR um, a a sensor as well. And so the theory is that by providing these remote effective signals, that should enable the remote person to feel some of the same emotion as the person who's pl uh, playing the experience. So here's a, a video of what this might look like. This is a, a kind of a house experience. Looking around the house, it looks quite normal. But then after a while, you discover this is actually quite a scary, haunted house. And you can see in the top um, right corner, this is the live, um, raw um, emotional data or signal com data coming through. The top one is the GSR. The bottom one is the heart rate. Um, is a little bit of a lag of about a, a half a second because we're sending it through um, a Bluetooth. But in a minute, you'll see the person looking up into the ceiling, and there is some dead. There's a dead body hanging from the ceiling, which is quite surprising. So you'll see the um, the GSR um, spike up and the heart rate also spike up. So here's a dead body here as well, and. Um, the spike is coming uh, in a second. There it comes right now. So there's a big spike in the output there. So just to wrap up, um, in this talk, what I've ta showed is how that you can use AR and VR systems for developing empathic computing interfaces. Uh, VR systems are really ideal for, for enabling people to try the experiences of others. So they're a really strong storytelling medium. They're a strong way to provide a total uh, immersive experience. And it's very easy to change body scale and representation. On the other hand, AR is a really great technology for en enabling live sharing and trying to help people share a live emotional-based um, experience. It allows overlay in the real world, supporting remote annotation and collaboration, and um, enhancing real-world tasks. So I think there's a really exciting trend now towards empathic computing, towards technology that enable us to understand emotions, to experience different people's emotions, and to share them. And certainly AR and VR enables these types of experiences by uh, changing our perspectives, by sharing spaces and experiences, and by supporting communication. But there are lots and lots of directions for future research. For example, how do we really measure emotion? How do we convey that to a remote person? How can we um, establish ground truths in these areas? So this is a research area we're just getting started off in my university. Um, if you'd like to collaborate with us on this, we'd love to have some partners. Um, here's my website, here's my email address, and here's my Twitter feed. So thank you very much uh, for your time.